Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of From the Lighthouse. So I'm Stephanie and I am sadly here without my co-host Michelle today, but happily I am joined by a senior member of staff, I mean senior in terms of experience only, um, and that is Associate Professor Marcel Freeman. Um, so Marcel teaches in the English and um, Creative Writing programs here at Macquarie University. She's also um, a published poet and writer and she is here today to talk to me about Big Little Lies and the reason I got her in here to talk to me is because in around 2003 she was um, very um, involved, very much involved or running the, the Masters of Creative Writing program and she had a student by the name of Leanne Moriarty who is of course the author of Big Little Lies which is now um, also a HBO television series. So Marcel is going to talk to me about the experience of working with Leanne um, as well as Big Little Lies the book and Big Little Lies the TV show. So welcome Marcel. Thank you Steph, thanks very much. I'm really happy to be here and to talk about um, Leanne who I'm very proud of. Yeah, you must be delighted <laughs> to have a student who's a New York Times bestseller. Having, you know, watched her career develop. It's, yeah. It was very rapid, actually. Yeah. So why don't you talk about um, what the experience w um, was like working with Leanne um, mm. when she was working on her first novel, I believe. Okay. So when um, I, early on in my um, working career here at Macquarie, um, I was um, doing a lot of supervision on the Masters in Creative Writing program. Uh, which was a fairly new program at the time, and um, at that at that time and still now, uh, one of the key aspects for the masters in creative writing is that students work on uh, a sustained creative writing project. Mm -hmm. um, so this may be part of a novel; it's around twenty five thousand words, so it's not going to be a full novel, mm -hmm. um, or a book of poems or stories or something like that. So Leanne was one of the people who was in that program and um, I was going to supervise her manuscript project mm -hmm. and um, of course at that time she was a student yep. um, and she was very keen to get um, our feedback on her work. She at that time hadn't actually published any adult writing. I don't know if she'd done children's writing um, but she just wasn't sure in her own mind whether her work was ready to be sent out for publication mm. or to an agent. Mm. And so she pr produced this piece which was called Three... Um, no, not Three Wishes. It was A Womb of One's Own. I think that's a fantastic title. <laughs> <laughs> a Womb of One's Own, which was about three sisters um, who are quite competitive <laughs> and who are all pregnant at the same time. Oh, dear. Or, or are two... Yeah, I think they're all pregnant at the same time where the book starts. Mm -hmm. And it kind of went back a bit. So it's set on the North Shore of Sydney. Um, the the characters were all, you know, kind of recognisable. Mm -hmm. It was it was certainly, as her books are now, a fantastically easy book to to relate to, uh, even in, in its manuscript form. Mm. And um, it was very heavily dialogue-driven. Mm. So she had a lot of dialogue in there. She's very good at creating scenes where people interact with each other. Um, and we worked on um, kind of cutting down a bit on the amount of dialogue. Mm. Um, but really, it was such a pleasure to work with her on that um, and on helping her develop the structure for the plot, although she already had that. She's really good at plot. She's got a basic instinct for plots. Um, and so she produced what was then A Womb of One's Own, <laughs> which was um, actually longer than the required length, yep. but it was okay because the people who, who marked it just wanted to read the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and she did very well. So after that, um, very soon after that, she submitted that manuscript to an agent and got snapped up by Macmillan. Yeah, I can imagine. And um, before we knew it, it was published, it was out, it was on the Women's Weekly bestseller list. But they took away the title. They took away the title, yeah. Mm. A Womb of One's Own was perhaps too literary. <laughs> I think they wanted to, I don't know, I'm not sure why they did, you know, these decisions are marketing based. Mm. Yeah, well. Yeah. And so it ended up being Three Wishes. Mm. But it did appear, and then um, basically... Uh, Eliane got even more famous because that book was then taken, it was bought by a publisher in the United States yeah. and it went right up onto the New York Times bestseller list. It's funny, I think that she's one of these writers that seems to be, it seems like her greatest success came in the US before it came in Australia in some ways. 
Yes and no. Perhaps when you have success in the States, it's just big. Yeah, that's true. I mean, if she was quite a big success here, you know, mm. being on the Women's Weekly Book of the Week or, mm. or Book of the Month mm. was actually a really big deal. Yeah. It, got, it was at that time, don't forget we're talking early 2000s here, mm. it was before the internet was so big. Yeah, that's true. And yeah. so it was a way of really focusing, um, you know, literature and books for a particular readership. Yeah. A female readership. It's funny, I don't think I remember how books were marketed before the internet. I know, it is funny, I actually hadn't thought of it until now. Yeah, I know. Until now. How do you find out about books without the internet? (laughs) Yeah, well, there were ways, and there were like, you know, there was also, um, you know, there were book shows and things on Mm. the radio, and a little bit on TV, but mainly mainly on the radio. Mm. Yeah, so that was the beginning of um, Leanne's career, which I followed with great interest, because I felt like it's a bit of a mother hen. Yeah, of course. Uh, or as I always do when my students publish, no matter what area they yeah. publish in. But I, I will say that I, I really believe that her work would, would have an audience. She wasn't sure mm. that her work would have an audience. And I was pretty sure that it did, as were other people who read it in the department. Yeah. People like I think Maria Mitchell was one of her readers, yeah. examiners, and she, you know, it was just a great read. Um, so yeah, so that was the, the start of Leanne's career. That's fantastic, and I, I mean, I've read Big, Big Little Lies, and yes, mm. I can attest to the fact that her novels are incredibly readable. Actually, I've given my mother is not a reader. She'll probably kill me for talking about her on this podcast, but here we go. My mother is not a reader. I've given her all of Leanne's novels, and she's read them. So, which is incredibly impressive because it takes a lot to get my mother to read, and she's read them and she loves them. Um, let's skip ahead to Big Little Eyes. Um, I'd be interested to hear your impressions of this novel because this is the novel that's really gone kind of nuclear. It has. It has. It's gone more than global. It's yeah. It's gone cosmic. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, look, I reading Big Little Lies and kind of reflecting back on how Leanne first came to me with her writing and to us with her writing, I can just see an incredible... Uh, I mean, the confidence was there, but the confidence is just huge. Mm. And this book uh, is so beautifully controlled mm. in terms of her control of the plot and of just the characterization and just the way... What makes the books readable is because she had, she she gives the reader everything they need to engage and to want to go on. Um, so I thought that this, the book was beautifully structured, mm. And um, I'm interested that she's still working w- within that sort of field of characters in a particular demographic. Very much, I think it's also still a Sydney book. Yeah. And it, to me, it's a very Australian book. Mm. Reading it, I can identify. Now, I do sometimes, I think with the American publications, there, there were some tweaks made. I'm not sure, but I think there usually are a few tweaks made so that things are not um, too sort of culturally specific. Mm -hmm. Um, But when I read Big Little Lies, I sort of thought, okay, so what's she doing here? She's she's setting up this brilliant idea, which is actually was there with Three Wishes as well, where something terrible happens, and I'm not going to spoil. Something terrible is going to happen, and the book basically starts to set up our anticipation. Yeah. Of, of that, a bit like a detective. Yeah, it's very uh, much like a murder mystery, mm, isn't it? Yeah, so um, like you say, um, once you start it, you don't put it down. That's right. And um, But I think also what really, uh, what I really like about it is the way in which she doesn't, she, she doesn't um, hesitate to take on difficult mm. issues. And I think one of the key ones in this book, of course, is domestic violence and also bullying mm. um, and um, sort of male violence against women, mm. but also vice versa. There's a bit of a hint that it's not not all one way necessarily, but the dynamics yeah. of how it can happen within a community. Yeah, that's what really interested me mm. too, that portrait of, and I agree that it's very Sydney, I can, Im- I can imagine that, that kind of I don't know, moneyed Palm Beach milieu. And, but what also interested mm. me is the competition between the women. You know, that kind of, you know, who is the best at being a mummy and, you know, who is who has the most money and who has the time to spend and who has the best party. And I loved those scenes in which um, Renata's daughter's party, 
becomes, you know, this issue of contention of who's going to go and who isn't going to go. And I just thought, oh, gosh, it, all of my friends who have children, this is their life, you know. I know. The parents are so invested in these really little children. Mm. And um, I must say that it has a real ring of mm. truth, um, particularly among certain demographics. I mean, there are some demographics where no one's got time for this stuff. Yeah, well, that's right. Um, <laughs> but in demographics like the one in which Leanne has put her book, where mm. you know there's, uh, there's you know it's, it's upper middle class or or more. Mm. Um, a, a number of mothers don't work. Mm. Um, there's a lot of time for helicoptering. Mm. <laughs> there's a lot of time for really being very involved, not only with your children's social lives, but with their school lives. Yeah. And to some extent, schools encourage that because they want the PNC, they want the parents to help out and so on. Mm. But I think this shows, it's almost like a parody of what actually happens. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes, <laughs> considering we know that there's been some kind of terrible event that's come yeah, out of, like, of, a, of a school's a school activity. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's something about Leanne's writing, that she takes what looks, or on the surface, looks ordinary mm. and kind of, you wouldn't even question it, this is how people live, this is what's going on, but she kind of digs under the surface and she asks the what-if question. Mm. Yeah, the, the what's and happening underneath all of this glossy surface. And that's what yeah. the title implies, I think, the you yeah. know, big little lies, that there are so many lies and levels of lying yeah. in the book. Um, the other thing I really um, thought was clever is the way she set up the, the narrative with the... Uh, she's got her main characters, Celeste and Ma Madeline. Madeline, and their various partners and children and so on. Mm. Um, she's got Jane mm -hmm. and her little boy, Ziggy, who are key. Yep. Um, but then she's also got... We get such a strong sense of as community around. I mean, it's a limited community. It's mm. a community of this little school. Um, so it doesn't go beyond the school. Yeah. But it's a, like a microcosm Yeah. for a much wider social milieu. And I think there's a lot of critique in it. But the what you get coming through, I think we've talked about this before, Stephen, yeah. where you said it's a kind of Greek chorus effect. Yeah. You know, where these other voices come in and comment. And I found that actually very effective. First of all, it kept in my mind as a reader that something was going to happen. Yeah, because, it ratchets up the tension and the yeah, suspense, doesn't because it? Because yeah. people are sort of looking, almost reflecting back and saying, gosh, how did this happen and this was what was going on. But there's another level to it, which is this is issue of the kind of Chinese whispers, mm. where people hear something and then it kind of gets, you know, it, it, nobody knows that it's actually happened, but because it gets passed on as rumour, it becomes real. Mm. It's real in the minds of those who hear it, not necessarily of who's involved in it. Yeah. And because you don't, and we are working at the level of rumour, you, mm. you have all of these kinds of people speculating on what's happened or speculating about, you know, the mm. root cause, but you, you can't trust any of it because it's, it is, you know, Chinese whispers and rumour and mm. gossip. But at the same time, it, it gets you thinking about all of those things and, and the significance of, of, of particular events as well. Yeah, and it's kind of looking for the smoking, you know, that yeah. if there was a fire, there must have been smoke. Yeah, that's right. Um, sort of in retrospect, um, you know, when the big climax comes, it's like, but of course you've been seeing the whole build-up, that's the premise yeah. of the book, is what, what happens to lead to the, the, to the final climax. But there's a lot on the way that it's not only dependent yeah. on that. Um, yeah, so did you have anything else about the book that you thought um, no I just thought discussing? I thought that um, what your point about plot is really well made because to me the, the the brilliant thing about Leanne Moriarty is how good she is at plot everything comes back to this this incident at the end of the book everything mm. feeds into that but she doesn't wrap everything up in a little no. bow either it's not a neat ending in that it's not kind of a pat ending where everybody gets a you know a nice little happy ending and we can all feel good mm -hmm. there are still things dangling there are still sort of complexities there but everything that needs to be wrapped up is wrapped up and i mm -hmm. and i read a lot of contemporary fiction um for, for pleasure obviously um and i find that a lot of novels kind of end in a bit of a muddle or at least I get a sense that they end in a bit of, bit of a muddle, mm. and I find that plot isn't necessarily the strong point of a lot of writers working today, whereas I find her, she is so good at plot. Mm. She, you can tell that she, she has planned and um, placed all of these things in, in, in where they need to be in order to, to wrap the plot up in a really satisfying way. Yeah, and, I, and although it's, it's seamless, you can't see it, 
there's mm. a great deal of work that went into making that work. Mm. And when I came to the ending, I thought, the ed- ending is so good, and you've really worked on your ending. Mm. But she doesn't. <laughs> but as you say, there's no. You can't see it you being can't done. See the work. Yeah. It, it's transparent. Like it's, it, you can't actually see the amount. Of work. It's like that with any writing. Mm. A novel is such hard work. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> it is because you've got to solve problems all the way. And she would mm. have come up against a number of problems mm. that she would have had to resolve. Even as an experienced writer, each book is a new beginning. That's right. Because yeah. each book is different. Um, so. I'm only imagining here because I don't know if we need to talk to Leanne herself yeah, to find right. out some of this. Um, but just looking at it, it, it's got that extraordinary kind of ease and polish of a reading in, in, a, in the reading that kind of belies the amount of work that would have gone into its conceptualization and just making that concept work. Yeah. Well, I mean, sometimes you know. when that amount of work kind of has been done on a plot level, you can kind of see it mm. in a novel. You can kind of see the, the author going, okay, well, we have to put this over here because yes. this has to happen. I didn't see that in this, and so no. I thought that's a real real um, expert at yeah. plotting. Um, I'm interested now to, to hear your thoughts on the, the HBO series because it's such a huge series. It's got heaps of attention. I must have read 15,000 thing pieces about it. Um, it's got, you know, Reese Witherspoon who spearheaded the project. It's got, um, Nicole Kidman who's getting a lot of buzz, Shailene Woodley, Alexander Sarsgaard, Laura Dern. I mean, the, the names attached to this project are staggering. Yes. So what did you think? Well, I think it's definitely, as you say, it's been pitched really high it's yeah. a big earner for HBO yeah uh, and it's because of the top names in it um, it's doing what a lot of TV series do now where they really get big names in because mm. this is what people are watching perhaps more than movies well it's the era of prestige TV isn't it yeah it's on HBO which has got that kind of aura of big TV about it anyway yeah. it's got big movie stars who you know you mightn't expect in a television show absolutely and I, I and I think just to get down to the craft of the making of of it and I haven't seen all the episodes mm-hmm. but even from what I have looked at I think the casting is brilliant mm. and I think the translation to an American context a California context mm. I think is what we're seeing here yeah um, is is done extremely well mm. um, and also though the translation from a novel to a, dr- a, a television drama series yeah which is a different format that's right um, so they've done a lot of things which are fascinating when you start to think about unpicking them. I don't know if you've noticed what any things are that are different. Well, I mean, I what what sort of struck me about the series that I really enjoyed. First of all, I absolutely adore Reese with Spoon as Madeline. I think she is perfection. Um, that kind of type A maniac that that Reese with with Spoon often plays is played to absolute. And I mean. I may relate a little bit to that, so <laughs> maybe that's why I, I it works for me. But actually, what what kind of worked for me the most was the kind of explication, I suppose, of the the Celeste Perry storyline with the the scenes in the therapist. Now, I think that might that must be a really hard. I mean, obviously, I don't know anything about making television, mm. but you know, we've got scenes where they're just talking to a therapist about their marriage, yet somehow they manage to be, you know, completely compelling and, you know, you have to kind of watch them and they're brilliantly acted and they're brilliantly portrayed. And so the way that the the, the series has kind of delved more into the Celeste Perry relationship, mm. um, which is a relationship of domestic violence, of, of you know, psychosexual abuse, or mm. um, it, to me was the real strength. And because you had kind of that space to... Um, to explore that in a TV series, whereas in a movie, you, you know, you would only have a you know a few scenes. Mm. Because we had the the space of a television series, and because it's such a visual format, you were able to see the violence in a much more mm. kind of um, intense way. And so that's what really kind of struck me about the series, as, as that was the most kind of interesting translation of the the book to the to the series. Yes, look, I agree with you, and I think that one of the what I experienced in watching you know, the X number of episodes that I've watched compared to having read the book is that I thought I was experiencing the television drama series as darker mm. than the book. Yeah, it is, I think. Yeah. Um, I think um, there's a lightness, even though the this, this topic of, of domestic violence is definitely in the book, and of course it is, um, but there's also the there's, there's comedy as well. Yeah. And I think the comedy, there is some, in the, well, maybe there's more than I've actually seen, but 
Um, I, it just felt darker. Mm. And I think that one of the reasons may be, I mean, the writing of the whole series is, is, is quite brilliant, the adaptation. Mm. Um, is um, when you think about um, when you think about a TV series like that, not only does it have the big names to attract its audience, but it's also got to attract its audience across um, a, a different set of a dif- just a different set of consumers. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's, it's pitched, I think, to a di- bit of a different demographic. It is, and it's also pitched differently gender-wise. Mm. I thought that one of the biggest changes for me, um, which was very interesting, was the increased development of the male characters in the TV series. Yeah. There's quite a lot of that. We see, and that's because it's it's also spaced out, it's got the room to do this, Mm. but we see actual developments which are only hinted at. For example, the character Ed. Yeah, Madeline's husband. Madeline's husband is just a good guy. Yeah. (laughs) And obviously he's there as a kind of foil to... Perry and others mm. uh, who are less good, yeah, <laughs> as men, uh, but very complex, yeah. Um, but Ed is given much more of a of a persona. Um, he does more. He has more scenes. He, yeah. There's a lot more. And when I thought about that afterwards, and I'm I'm not going to give away the end. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying very hard not to give away spoilers. No spoilers. Today. But when I came to the end of the book, um, and there was it did end pretty much on a note with Ed and Madeline Mm. I thought yeah there's more here than we've actually seen and the and the TV relationship yeah the TV series picks up on that Mm -hmm. in an interesting way there's a little bit of of kind of nuance to Ed there's a scene in which he he talks to Nathan who is Madeline's first Mm -hmm. husband um, where he kind of threatens him and and well he does threaten him Mm -hmm. but it and it's got a kind of menace to it that scene even though it is this you know quite small um, nerdy looking guy mm-hmm. he has that he has like a menace to, to him in that scene that I thought was interesting and I, I, I do think that they're picking up on that kind of ambiguity um, around their relationship at the end of the book but yeah I agree that he's given much more space to be a character even mm-hmm. Nathan the first husband is given more of a yeah I mean Ed is still a good guy yeah he's still a good guy complex. yeah exactly he's not just good He's no, got other things yeah, going he's, on. He's, he's multidimensional, yeah. and in his interactions with other males, which we don't see much of, yeah, in the book at all. Yeah. Uh, and I suppose we might then also consider: is the book written for a female readership, whereas the TV series is Amy, which I think it is, but mm. don't see what you think. Um, at just having a broader gendered, yeah, um, I think I focus. Yeah, I think the 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 book is. I mean, I don't think Leanne was imagining a 100% female readership, no. but mostly female readership, mm. certainly. And, I mean, we know from, like, statistics that women read more fiction and that, you know, most of her readers are going to be women anyway. And it's very much in a, a kind of female readership mm. kind of um, space. Whereas the TV show, I think, is is trying to get men involved as well. Um, as viewers, I think that it is much... It's pitched at a kind of broad audience. Um, it's certainly pitched at an American audience. Mm. Um, we see the, the setting translated to California, as you said. Um, and so there is much more of a focus on the men and the men in their lives and the relationships between the, the women and the men mm-hmm. um, become a little bit more kind of nuanced, I think. So there is a... Mm-hmm. I think there there is a kind of definite focus on that. And Perry's character is fleshed out a yeah. lot too in this series. Yeah, as is um, Madeline's ex-husband, Nathan. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, who actually comes across much more fully realised in mm. the television series once again mm. and a lot more aggressive. Yeah. Um, and also a lot more struggling with what he's got in his life now. Yeah. <laughs> I found him interesting, although I hated him. Yeah. <laughs> the TV series. <laughs> yeah. And I thought, Madeline, you're well shot of this guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Forget about him, Madeline. <laughs> you know. Um, you're but, married to Adam Scott now. <laughs> you, you just ignore got him. someone else now. <laughs> just move on. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Which is probably what Ed was thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why is she hung up on this dude? He's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> but um, look, yeah, I think um, I think the, the development of the male characters is interesting, but it also allows for that focus on the domestic violence theme mm. to be nuanced a lot. Mm. So, okay, we get Ed and then we get Perry in the book. It's a kind of contrast, con- mm. you know, oppositions. But there's lots more nuancing around men and, and how they social... So kind of socially construct themselves mm. and how they operate within, you know, w- 
within the world of this of this um, of this film, the, the series. Yeah, you know? I think they do that with with Perry in an interesting way. I think Alexander Sarsgaard is really good as Perry, mm-hmm. and I mean the way he talks in those therapy scenes about um, about how like a lot of his violence is not excused by, and mm-hmm. it's not a justification, but mm-hmm. it's kind of an explanation. Is is that he's really insecure. Mm. And he's he's married to this beautiful woman, and you know he, he he has all of these hang-ups about whether she really loves him, and she you know is getting increasingly kind of you know annoyed by this line because she's given up her career, and you know she's submitted to his kind of control um, in order to make him feel kind of better. And he and he constantly talks about how insecure he is about her leaving him, and so then he kind of tries to provoke these things so he can control them. And so there is a lot of kind of interesting um, psychological study, I suppose, of those two characters and how they interact. And, I mean, the series has the advantage of, like, having actors embody these things. Mm -hmm. And because they've got such big name, like, really good actors, they can bring, like, depths of characterization Mm -hmm. to, to these characters that you might necessarily kind of... Not that you can't get nuance on the page, but it's it's different kind of seeing them there in front of you. It is because the reading experience, um, as we know, all we have in front of us is a book. That's right, yeah, or a Kindle or whatever. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and um, imaginations do the rest. Yeah, and so I had already imagined these characters in mm. my mind, and then I looked at the television series. Um, if I went back and read the book. It'd be interesting. I think I would probably go back to what my imagination gave me. Mm. Um, but the point is, when you when you watch, you know, your imagination works differently and in other ways mm. if you're given the visual format. If you're given the film, it's such a naturalistic format. It, it kind of gives you everything you need to That's share right. the experiences. Whereas when you read, your mind has to hook up against things that you've already experienced. I mean, cognitively, that's what happens. Mm. Um, and you, you begin to imagine these characters. Mm. Um, I mean, the one that's really interesting for me is the character Jane. Yeah. When I read the book, for me, Jane was much more plain. Yeah, well, they... <laughs> this is this is Hollywood, everyone's beautiful. Yeah. So exactly. <laughs> and not only plain, but also some, a lot more self-effacing, a lot less feisty and strong whereas in the tv series jane is damaged mm. but angry yeah she's kind of she's very <laughs> feisty in the yeah. series yeah. whereas i think in in the book the anger only comes much later mm. yeah she seems yeah she I, doesn't even know why she's moved to this place yeah i agree <laughs> in the book she you definitely get the sense of this like little fearful woman who is kind mm. of like why am i doing this or, you yeah know, and kind of doing the best she can, and yeah. she's put with these women who are all very competitive, and she's really out of depth and all of this. But in the in the um, series, I got the sense that she was, she knew herself, she knew what she was doing, but she was just had this emotional kind of scar from what has happened to her. Um, and you can see in those like flashbacks that they yes. can consistently do with all the fast cuts and all of that, that emphasis on like the fact that she has been incredibly damaged by what has happened to her but that she is a kind of fully formed character anyway. Um, whereas in the book, I got more of a sense of, of her kind of dislocation and fear and confusion. Yeah, and, and finding her way and, and even yeah. finding her way as a mother and mm. um, finding her way in relation to her family and as a single mom mm. in, a, in a world where everyone's couples. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Especially in this kind of, you know, But she's, like the, she's world. like the catalyst, isn't she, into yeah. this world? Because she comes in and she's other. Yeah. She's different. She's the fish out of water. Yeah. And she's single, mm-hmm. single parents. So they immediately that sets up a whole lot of assumptions that people start to make about her and her child. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is fantastic material for social satire and social critique. That's right. And even the house, like, I think one of the greatest things about this series, I, if only for, like, the viewer, is the houses. Yeah. They live in these insanely huge houses that are insanely beautiful. Like, Reese Witherspoon's kitchen in this series is just... My platonic ideal of a kitchen. Um, oh, oh, Steph, just to interrupt you for a yeah, second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How could Ed and Madeline... Who knows? How could they afford it? He's a freelance journalist. I know. How can they lose... He's a freelance computer well, something yeah. programmer have, dude. Where does all the money come from? <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. But anyway, that's just is, an aside. But I just, it yeah. did make me kind of say, 
I didn't see them like that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but their house is out of control, and mm. Celeste and Perry's house is beautiful. Renata's house is amazing. Mm. And then you go to Jane's house, and mm. it's such a shorthand for, like, how different she is because she's in this pokey little um, flat. Mm. Um, it seems to be, like, at the back of somebody's house or, you know, a little freestanding, like, little mm. house. And it's so different from the houses that the others live in. Um, you know, mm. she's got... She's, you know, I think they're all in one room or there's only one bedroom or something like that. And it's, it's very, small. it's small, it's pokey. Mm. You can see right away how much she doesn't belong in that yeah, environment. And it's old, it's vintage. Um, yeah. So that she's already situated in in a different space. Um, yeah. And even it, that's in the book as well, although we don't actually get a sense of what the houses are like. We can imagine. Yeah, we, yeah that's right. Um, but on the TV, it's all done for you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, whereas in the book, I mean, the, 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 she's like in a, Probably in a kind of you know nineteen sixties flat, mm. yeah, <laughs> you know in DY sort of thing. Yeah, you know, it, it's just that kind of the red brick, just you know, um, mm. yeah. She's just in a, in a small apartment. In yeah, the beach. but you have to kind of do all the work in the book, don't you, to imagine yeah, that? Yeah, Whereas here, yeah. there's that's you know you don't have to do any work. You no. just see the houses and you get okay. This is really really wealthy people. Absolutely, and you can see why that has to be because you, you know your main audience is American, huge audience. Mm. Whereas um, a reader who can identify with the setting and mm. with the environment and the society of the of the Australianness of the book mm. can immediately start putting things together. It doesn't matter if you're in Foster by the Sea or you're mm. in, you know in a North Shore suburb. You can immediately start putting a little. You know, you've got those cues mm. in your mind. So um, yeah, and I think it, look at this. It's in glamour. Oh yeah, attached to the series, um, but if you, it is different. It's not the same as the book. The book is is this, and the mm-hmm. and you know the TV series is that, and it taps into um, a lot of the expectations of the audience mm. in positioning these characters. And I think it's clever that the domestic violence is actually dealt with within such an upper crust kind of community. Yeah, it's not something that only happens to poor people who live or you know trailer trailer park people yeah. and that sort of thing. It's something that can happen. Yeah, you know. Well, that's what Rosie Batty said, didn't it? Yes. Didn't she? You know that it's not about like people who, you know, as you say, are mm. poor and uneducated. This could happen mm. at in the nicest most beautiful house in the richest um, you know street in the city mm-hmm. and and Celeste and Perry is so wealthy and they're so pretty and their house is so pretty and then they're and perfect. then everything looks perfect and that's what everyone keeps saying to them on the on the surface mm-hmm. everyone's like you know well they're both gorgeous they're both you know loving. They're, they're loving they're in, so in love and <laughs> they've got this beautiful house and they've got these two perfect twins and yet what we because we have access we can see that actually it's completely terrible yeah in fact I think what was so interesting was the portrait of marriages generally Mm. yeah the ones we see um, there's no such thing as a functional marriage (laughs) I mean there's just shades of functionality yeah you know um, better functioning and worse functioning but you know difficult with young children a marriage like there's no that whole happy families thing is a myth yeah I mean I mean what I mean is the, the perfect family that everyone is at great pains to present to the world mm. um, particularly in the book my successful child, my gifted child my yeah. my wonderful husband my beautiful house, my cars yeah. you know, all of that um, it's people chasing that fantasy mm. um, and of course just underneath mm. that's what the li- one of the lies the yeah. social lies that are told um, are, are the anxieties around that mm. which create these mummies you know the, the yummy mummies. There's this great scene where <laughs> Reese Witherspoon and I don't know if you've seen it yet, but Re- Reese Witherspoon and Nicole Kidman as, as Madeline and Celeste are sitting in the car and they're discussing like working as as mothers. And mm. Reese Witherspoon's character does not work, and neither does um, Celeste. But mm. Celeste is being prevented from working by her husband, whereas Madeline kind of dabbles in the theatre world. Mm. But yeah, I think I remember yeah, that scene. Yeah, she's not kind of working full time, mm. and they, they talk about guilt and. Mm. Um, you know how to make those decisions about working or not working and how much involvement they're going to have in the in the family whether they're going to be full-time mothers mm-hmm. and and Celeste confesses that the most fun she's had in you know years is been working has been mm-hmm. she's just done some you know little kind of freelance pro work bono, some yeah. pro bono work yeah. for for Madeline and that's been like the most fulfilled that she's mm-hmm. been for years and years even though she's 
got the, you know, the perfect house and husband. So it's, I thought it was actually quite not radical but unusual to have women kind of talking about these issues like how to balance work and the family, the guilt they feel for making decisions in one way or another, mm-hmm. that kind of um, the myth that, you know, staying home with the kids is, is the most wonderful thing and blah, blah, blah. I, I thought it was... It was um, Refreshing to hear those conversations. It was very refreshing. It was something that any woman who has young children would mm. be relating to big mm. time. Yeah. Whether she works part time, full time, mm. not at all. Yeah. There's a very lovely statement that one of them says that um, it's not nearly enough. Mm. Looking after children at home is not nearly enough for me. Mm. How many women have I spoken to who have said that? And I've experienced that myself when mm. I had young children. Much as you love them and you want to be there for them, it's not enough. Mm. And so it's a very real theme. Yeah. It's a very relatable theme. Um, and I think some of the, the issues around it to me are, are completely realistic. Mm. And the way that the husbands and the, or the partners react mm. to what the wives might want or need and the variations of that. I mean, to me, that's completely realistic. And it is refreshing to see it in such a in such a, a mass audience kind of uh, drama. Yeah. It's, it's a real women's issue. Yeah, it is. It's a real women's issue. But, you know, Steph, I think that the, the, this, is a, this is a dialogue that women have been having all the way going back to the 1970s feminism. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, because that was like where it all started. And women then got swept out completely the other way mm. and said if you stayed home and looked after your children, you were letting the sisterhood down. Mm. You were copping out. Um, you know, this was kind of post-1950s, 60s, mm. at that time where women were all being told, you know, the feminism was saying go out and mm. get a job and don't just stay home with your children. Well, there's a cost yeah. as well. So it's a, it's a juggling act that women who are professionals and who have got young children, um, the choices that they have to make about how they're going to live their lives so that they can be both a mother and also have a life that they will want to pick up on at some point because the children go to school and think they grow up and so on mm. and you don't want to be left with nothing and what about all that university training mm. yeah. that you did you know, to get your career so I think um, yeah, I think this is something that um, it's really good to see it presented here mm. um, that level of discontent but at a really deep emotional and psychological level is, is interesting to me and anyone watching would think what are these women? Look at their houses. What have they got to be discontented about? And yet... Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, that's interesting <laughs> with Renata, isn't it? Because she's the one who does have the big the big job. You know, she's yes. a CEO of a company and she's, you know, constantly busy. She's always on the phone. And you see that subtle judgment that some of the other mothers take to her yes. because she, you know, she can't do the, the PNC thing and she, she's she can't always, do the drop-off and all of that. She's always got a board meeting. She always she says she's got a board meeting. meeting. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So she's constantly in and out. And you can see that there's this, and she talks about the kind of guilt of, of you know, having to be not as present. Mm. And the other mothers kind of get a little bit weird about how not present she is at certain times. And so you can see how all of these things are really fraught. Mm. Like all of these decisions are political and all of these decisions have kind of impact like uh, and are read in different ways. Mm. And I think it's great that that's on television. Yeah, so the mothers who, who are not working, yeah, not all of them, but some of them, will look at the mothers like Renata who really flaunt the fact that they've got a career. Yeah. And so the stereotype will fit in. Yeah. Will, sit, will start to kind of kick in and... It's quite easy to turn a, against someone like that. Mm. I mean, one of the dynamics of the group mm. and the way people can turn on each other, I found it actually quite horrifying. Yeah, it's a bit <laughs> scary, isn't it? I think that um, and that's something that's come out of like that focus on women's issues and motherhood and so forth is something that um, Reese Witherspoon, as the exec producer of the show, has mm. talked about a lot because she um, started her own production company that's very interested in kind of... Um, Turning uh, books by women into into series and movies and so forth, because she found that there was a lack of good roles for women that weren't, you know, she wanted roles that weren't kind of about being the girlfriend mm. or about you know motherhood in a very kind of flat way where the mother is you know this perfect being who just exists for their children. And so here we have this show where we have like five really, if you count um, Bonnie and Renata, five kind of women mm. who are talking about things that matter to women. Mm. 
on a network television show, Absolutely. you know, mm-hmm. that is, has a huge viewership and because it's got these big names to attach to it, has a lot of prestige attached to it as well. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, and I think the big, I think you're right. I think the big names thing is a big factor mm. um, in in bringing this kind of this women's issue thing into um, a kind of into mainstream. Yeah, if you like, and making it much harder to relegate it. Yeah. So that's just a that's a chicklet. That's you know kind of chick yeah. movie. Um, I think it gets harder and harder to do that. Yeah. Well, and the way they've done it is, I mean, you know, that's the, why the men are there. Yeah, and it, and it's filmed in such a way that it's got you know, it it, it is quite innovative in its use of like the flash forwards and the flashbacks mm. and the chopping and and so forth. It's got a kind of aura of prestige to it. Yes, that that means that you can't kind of dismiss it as chick lit in the way that people yeah. might with a novel. Yeah, so I mean, you know, for her as a producer, I think that mm. would be very satisfying. To, you know, you know, to see how that's working. Yeah. I mean, I haven't read any of the background. You've done your your background on the. I, I like the I said, I read, must have read about fifteen thousand on the pieces. television series. <laughs> so I, I I really am not on top of how it's been received, but I would yeah. imagine it's been it's been pretty well received. Yeah, no, it's been it's been very glowingly written about, especially because of that that focus on women mm. and having women. Because I mean, when you think about like prestige television and who prestige television is usually about, it's usually about your Don Drapers, your Walter Whites, mm. your Tony Sopranos, you know, male. Um, kind of anti-heroes and mm. here we have five women who are all very different mm. who are different ages you know like Jane is very young um, Renata's a bit older you know they're, they're not all kind of cookie cutter women so I, that has been a kind of singled out and especially to Nicole Kidman's performance as Celeste has been I think very well received we'll see anyway they may be up for some Emmys soon so It'll be interesting, you know, but I must say that it sort of struck me when I was watching it, and even when I imagined it in reading it, and it shows how informed we are by media, mm. everybody's beautiful. They are, I know. Everybody's beautiful. and Even I, the children are beautiful. Yeah, I think it would, the children are wonderful in this. Yeah. I mean, it's been so well done. I know. I mean, how did they find such good child actors? Oh, they just <laughs> work, oh, you work hard. You need yeah, hard work with I'm sure. <laughs> but I'm just thinking, like, I think another, like another innovation would be to start casting well older women, yes, because there are things that have older women roles, and mm. you know there's that. But older women and maybe less beautiful in the conventional mm. Mm. kind of model yeah. way. They've all got magnificent bodies. They all do. Every one of them. There's nobody who's a bit overweight. Yeah. There's no one who, and yet you know, when you read the book, you can imagine that there's a bit. Of, you know, you can, yeah, they're you normal see, people. You, yeah. You have a, a much better kind of, I guess, more grounded and yeah. more realistic view of these people. Um, I, and I, I don't know what the way around that is because there are certain expectations within mm. television industry, I guess. And remember that the expectations are not only about attracting a big audience, which is important. Um, it's also about attracting a big audience that will a- attract advertising. That's right, yeah. Because that's really the bread and butter mm. of uh, of the television drama mm. success or not. You mm. know, whether you it's going to be able to attract the funding that comes through advertising. Yeah, and you can't have... Well, and I mean, I, I think that where, where TV shows have kind of been more diverse in their in the kind of actors and the way they look, mm. um, what you do is that becomes the topic. Mm. You know, when you have like yeah. a, 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 say, a plus-size actress, mm. it becomes all about, oh, that's the show with a plus-size actress. It's not like something that fades into the background. It becomes like a topic of conversation in and of itself. So, in fact, this abnormal beauty is normalised. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, like everybody is just so beautiful. And everybody that's, and that's is what so you expect yeah yeah when you're watching a, you know a television series that you're going to see gorgeous looking people and then and they're wearing gorgeous looking clothes like as you as you, you pointed out about mm. um madeline's house um i'm a bit of a um fashion maven and so i've, <laughs> I've done a bit of the re- of reading about the clothes on the series and she's constantly wearing dolce gabbana right so dolce gabbana dresses would cost about five thousand dollars a piece right so she's going to on a school run in dolce gabbana right so how do you how do you afford that? <laughs> and like that's not really kind of realistic. No, it's not. The way they dress is not realistic, given what they're doing. Yeah. Um, and I she's think, in heels and massive do you think, heels. Do you think that? But I mean, that's the kind of product, almost product placement, but also setting up 
the desire in the yeah, consumer that's right. to look like that. Yeah, it's it's aspirational, isn't it? It is. It's yeah. got that kind of, and, and I mean, consumerism is so tied in with what we're talking about. Mm. You want your advertisers; they're going to say, okay. Who's watching the series? How many? How much advertising can we attract? Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, just think about what could be advertised around mm. this particular this particular series. That's right. And as you say, who knows? There may be your product placement. <laughs> no, big stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, big, that's the right. most expensive, the most wealthy of, of um, mm. companies. You know. Um, mm. Yeah. So that link in. I mean, when you start sort of analysing down what television drama is. Yeah. Um, it comes down to some very interesting things. Yeah. And that doesn't really necessarily correspond with what the messages are that we're getting, you know, what the, the, the actual issues, the realistic issues about women and violence and, and yeah. social norms and, you know, expectations of one's children's lives and so on. Um, that That's kind of... It's critiquing what it actually perpetuating. That's right, because it <laughs> critiques this system of, of wealth and privilege at the same time as it demonstrates that yeah. as a kind of commodity kind of fetish for us as viewers mm. like we want that we I mean I remember watching and looking at her kitchen and just going my god like that house I want it but like the point is that the point that the book and the and the series is trying to make is that that's not all it's cracked up to be but yet mm. I was sitting there going I want that that's what people aspire to <laughs> that's and exactly when I actually was listening to the radio this very morning and mm. there was a report on the level of debt mm. in the United States yeah because people are spending way more than they have because they want to acquire these things yeah and it's easy to see why when, you, when, when they're presented in a way that makes them look so spectacular Absolutely. So maybe then seeing that what's underneath the spectacularness mm. <laughs> um, is quite a healthy message. Possibly, yes. I think so. Maybe I should stop coveting her shoes, her handbags, her dresses and her kitchen. Um, I think that's all we have time for today. Thank you so much, Marcel. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've loved talking about Leanne Moriarty's book and the TV series with you, Steph. It's been fantastic. It has been a lot of fun. And if you're looking for something wonderful to read, I think you have an endorsement of the, a very healthy endorsement of the book and a strong endorsement of the te television show as well. Um, so thank you everyone for listening. This has been another episode of From the Lighthouse. Uh, once again, if you can rate and review us on iTunes, that would be super, super helpful. Um, please shoot us any feedback that you have through our website, which is fromthelighthouse.org. Um, any suggestions for future episodes would be appreciated. And we'll see you again in two weeks. We miss you, Michelle. Bye.